So a little bit about my background. So my name is Kathy. Once again, I, um, I'm a biotech and healthcare entrepreneur. I've had a pretty unusual journey. Um, I first started my scientific journey when I was really young at 14 years old. I started working at university labs and I published my first paper uh, when I was 16 years old. And then when I was 18, I became the youngest founder of a biotech company that was VC backed. Um, so that was my first company, Renomics. Um, and then I dropped out of University of Toronto to be part of the Teal Fellowship, which is when you get $100,000 to drop out of school for two years. And then afterwards, I started a company called LockBio, which is uh, sort of like an online digital health platform where, you, where we, uh, our clients sell prescription medications, telehealth consultations, et cetera. Um, and most recently, I joined Cold Spring Harbor Labs as, uh, as part of their board of directors. Um, Cold Spring Harbor Labs is the, probably one of the most prestigious labs in the world where they discovered DNA um, and eight Nobel laureates live there currently. So that's kind of the work I do between healthcare and uh, biotech. Uh, my first company was in the genomics space and I'm also working on a gene editing project now which is uh, something that's really interesting and I'll get into it afterwards. And I also want to give a shout out to Leo here, who I met on this trip. Uh, Leo has helped me with setting up the experiments and also um, finding plants, et cetera, and just help, being very helpful in general. So give everybody a clap for Leo. <clears throat> so let's start with the genomics industry. I want to talk a little bit about Moore's Law. So this is a Moore's Law graph about semiconductors. Um, we see that the um, energy efficiency of computers has doubled every 1.5 years over the last 60 years, and that, um, and, and that kind of follows this trend of what makes an innovative technology be very efficient and scalable. This Moore's law also applies to the cost of the human genome uh, for sequencing. And so as you can see here earlier in this um, millennium, one sequence human genome used to cost $100 million to do, now it costs less than $1,000. So what this represents is that it, there's a massive opportunity to better read our DNA, and not just our DNA as humans, but also the DNA of animals and plants. And, um, and there's a lot that we can do with that data, whether it's reading it better for diagnostics and prevention of diseases, or we can also now edit them, which is now writing our own DNA or writing the DNA of organisms. And one of the things that we're gonna do um, today and tomorrow is we're going to gene edit um, a real organism. Um, it's a plant, it's not gonna be anything crazy, but of course, if there's interest, we can always scale it up to um, you know, animals and other cool things in the future. <clears throat> so this is another example of the applications of um, what happens when you can gene sequence really cheaply. So this is an example of using the BRCA gene, the detection of the BRCA gene to prevent um, and diagnose the early onset or preventing uh, breast cancer and ovarian cancer in, in women. So if you, if you have a mutation in BRCA1 and BRCA2 that's known to cause disease, aka pathogenic, then you're able to prevent it much sooner. So that's one of the applications of genetic testing. Another application, maybe some of you guys have heard of this, uh, is embryo gene testing. So that means you can actually test the genes of your embryo to make sure that they're not going to be carrying diseases. Um, and then of course, there are always some very, um, I don't know, controversial, but also exciting use cases where you can test for um, features that you wanna see in a future kid. And of course, you can get into all sorts of realities where you can edit and change the genomes of the future, um, uh, future generations or future animals that would exist in the ecosystem. Um, so this is another visual example of, of um, genetics being used in an unnatural way. So this is like the GFP protein. This is a naturally observable and seen in jellyfish. And it's a bioluminescence that you can actually use CRISPR to put into the genomes of other animals and make them glow in the dark to make them have the same protein, the GFP protein, and characteristics of the jellyfish. So here you can see that you can do it in fish, flies, worms, um, plants as well. You can actually buy some glow-in-the-dark plants and fish. There's a company called Glowfish. 
GLO fish that just makes GFP fish. And they actually make tens of millions of dollars a year which just by selling GFP fish, which is actually not hard to make. Um, we actually have some really cool experiment kits here that um, some of you might be able to do later in the month that puts the GFP protein into E. coli, so bacteria, and you can make the bacteria glow in the dark because you're putting the gene from a jellyfish into the bacteria. Um, that's gonna be a little harder than the plant one, um, but we're gonna start with the plant one, see how people feel, and then we can do some more fun and complicated stuff like that. But those are the cool, visible, easy applications of gene editing, but it can really go anywhere from here. Um, you know, if you can just imagine, you can take the, uh, the, gene, the genes that encode for let's say the horn on a narwhal or rhino, it can take those genes and put it on a horse and it can actually make a unicorn. Um, and that's how it would work. You know, we can make any reality happen because we now understand the genome much better than before and we can also have the ability to rewrite the genome by inserting pieces of the genetic code from other species into um, other species where it doesn't really belong, but you know, we'll see what happens. That's part of the project I'm working on now, which. Um, I'll talk to you guys in a bit, about in a bit. Um, a little bit more about the genomics industry. So we just talked about um, the technology, some simple applications, some more you know, uh, serious applications, um, and some fun applications. But where we are as an industry is, um, is pretty early. I think this is one of the biggest challenges in the genome, uh, genomic space. You know, we're, we're taking a very innovative technology and we're applying a very antiquated playbook to that technology by p pushing it into you know, drug discovery, like we're trying to make gene therapies where, uh, you know, we have not yet found um, a proper and safe way to deliver it for a lot of these gene therapies. And, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of testing for genes that, um, you know, it, there's a lot of VUSs, variants of unknown significance. So there's a lot of data problems. There's a lot of um, issues with kind of putting the new, a new technology in an existing playbook and just kind of forcing it to happen. That's why insurance doesn't cover, like health insurance in the US doesn't cover a lot of the ge genetic tests anymore. Um, they cover BRCA1 and 2, but not a lot of the other genes. So it just prevents the growth of a really impressive t technology. What I'm hoping here is, um, what I'm hoping will happen in this session, but overall in a group like this, is for everybody to feel like gene editing is something that they can have an intuition about and actually have ideas about and then feel like they can actually do something about it. Like, it, I don't think it should be something that's locked up in a lab with, you know, PhDs and, and academia and grants and pharmaceutical companies all the time. I think this is now a technology that should be seen as something that belongs to the people because we're all made out of biology and biology is surrounding all of us. And I think the opportunities are huge. Um, I think it's an over $1 trillion opportunity for able to really reimagine reality in the ecosystems around us, redesign how forests, agriculture, you know, um, animals behave, um, you know, even humans, whether it's disease prevention or new medicines, um, you know, new types of animals. Those are all things that can happen once we really have a good grasp of this technology. And, there's gonna be so many creative uses of this, even, you know, for example, luxury pets, you know, who doesn't want a unicorn or, um, uh, what's another one, jackalope, you know, those are really cool myth mythical animals that never existed until we can actually now create them um, for the first time as humans. But it's not easy building in bio. I think one of the reasons why, um, you know, when I was in the Teal Fellowship, um, you know, Vitalik, you know, built Ethereum and people built cool, you know, OYO rooms. Those are all software applications or even a little bit of hardware, but no one really took off in the biotech space because it's just so hard to enter the space as a newcomer, as a young person, as someone with a lot of creative ideas because you have to get lab equipment, you have to have access to sterile facilities. A lot of times you have to have a PhD or above to, um, to, to be able to lead a lab with a research focus that you find interesting. Um, and of course, like there's a lot of mundane structures like the funding, publishing, um, other capital incentives that prevent real innovation. Um, but I think that's all about to change. Um, as you guys are seeing here, we can actually do a gene editing experiment in the middle of Thailand randomly. You know, we don't have to be confined to our computers just coding applications all day. We can actually be doing hands-on experiments and changing physical realities. <clears throat> and this is where network states or pop-up cities, I use it interchangeably, but Janine always corrects me, so I don't know what the right term is. <laughs> yeah, so this is where I think it's really interesting. Um, what 
what does biology look like in a network state or in a pop-up city? How can those two ideas really merge? I think we're gonna see a very small example with a simple gene editing experiment, but what can we really escalate that to and how do we scale it up to really interesting experiments that'll benefit you know, all of humans, uh, all of the humans that are part of the, the experiments, network states, or um, you know, just around the world. And <clears throat> one, one thing to really notice here is I think that gene editing in biology is an especially interesting area to focus on because it's decentralizable. Um, you know, in, the, in the past, with deep tech in general, it's something that's been very centralized. If you were to build a nuclear plant, nuclear weapons back in the day, you would have to have a very centralized facility. Now, really, anyone can have a lab. Anyone can get access to CRISPR. Anybody can get access to cells, DNA, order DNA online. My first company was making variant libraries for uh, pharma companies, synthetic biology companies, um, basically giving selling DNA. So you can really buy this stuff online. You can really buy um, you know, all the materials you would need and just searching, editing stuff. So that's why it's really decentralized and, and quite interesting. Biology typically had um, the, the characteristic of high technical risk and low market risk, basically meaning that it's the opposite of software. Software is something that has uh, low technical risk and high market risk. Like you would build an application, it's pretty easy, like if you code it, it'll be live. Um, but you don't know if people are gonna use the application. So there's like a high market risk when it comes to adoption. But biology, on the other hand, typically in the form of pharmaceutical products, it has um, a high technical risk and a low market risk because it's so hard to find a drug. Most drugs do not, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> Most drugs don't get to the end of the clinical trial process. They usually fail. And um, that's what makes it a high technical risk. And then, but if it does work, if you're able to cure some disease with the drug, then obviously there's no market risk because everybody wants it. Um, but what's really interesting right now is that gene editing has a pretty low technical risk and a low market risk because it's not really about the, the science anymore. Uh, I mean, there's, of course, a lot of science to be improved on, but as of right now, you can actually start making any organism. So it's actually more of an engineering problem than a scientific one and it has a low market risk because um, if you make something really cool, it'll sell. So that's why it's really interesting right now. And there's an opportunity here to create a network of independent labs, um, you know, just kind of in a decentralized um, framework to think about it a little bit differently than traditional academia and pharmaceutical companies. And one of the things that makes biology interesting as well to make it in different areas around the world um, through this idea of network states or pop-up cities is that you can take advantage of, different, of the different environments that you're in with different um, ecological characteristics and diversity. Um, you know, here we could not bring any plants to Thailand because that would violate a lot of customs rules. But what we're gonna do is find plants in Thailand from plant shops and edit them, gene edit them. So that's really cool. <clears throat> um, and just for me to rant a little bit more, in the traditional academia system, you know, it's really just funded by taxpayers, but when research is published in a peer-reviewed journal, what happens is you have to pay for that research article, you have to pay to read the research article, and then when there's a drug that was developed based on the research that you funded as taxpayers, you have to pay a lot of money for the drug. And it just doesn't make sense to me. So what I would love to do is create a new validation structure and through network states or pop-up cities, um, have people really directly benefit from the innovation happening in deep tech, and, and especially bio, where you can have you know, new agriculture or pets that are gene edited, or medicines and have people directly benefit from that. So changing really the entire structure of how we think about um, you know, validation incentives and how, um, how researchers are incentivized to do the best research possible. Um, yeah. So this is um, what we can do today. Um, what I'm trying to show here is I wanna create sort of a mini independent lab. What that looks like is um, we're gonna start with the plant gene editing stuff. That's to show that if you can code a web application or even not, not even that, I can't even code a web application, but if you can do like a website, you can definitely gene edit a plant. It's actually not that hard. So I wanna show everybody just how easy it is. Um, and, and if you're interested, there's of course more complicated things you can gene edit, but just starting here, I want everybody to feel like it's something they can do. It's something they feel like they have some intuition and, and knowledge about, not just something that's locked up in a lab far away and you, know, you need a PhD to really understand anything. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, 
So these are, so basically what we have here, um, I have a few of those and we have a bit more and we also have it online, so I'm happy to share it via Telegram to everybody. Um, but what we're trying to do here is take these three genes, um, I'm not gonna try to read them, but you guys can see them. Um, these three genes code for enzymes that, cr um, that essentially are the same enzymes you would say, see in beets, um, the, the vegetable that make them red. So we're taking, we're taking those three genes and putting them into a new plant. So what we're trying to do is find a plant that looks like this. It's a green, it's a, this is a tobacco plant, but you can really do it on any plant as long as the plant doesn't have a waxy leaf. And what we're gonna do tomorrow, so today we're gonna have to do some work as well, but tomorrow we're gonna inject these three genes into a plant, an unsuspecting plant in Thailand, we're gonna turn it red. So that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> I feel like this is like a magic trick or something, but. <laughs> um, so these are the three steps. I've just boiled it down to three really simple steps. So first you grow the agrobacterium, then you find a plant, and then we're gonna inject it and transform it. Injection and transformation are basically interchangeable. Um, that, I just don't wanna use any fancy words here. Um, but agrobacterium is essentially um, uh, what we have brought over that contains those three genes. And when we put the agrobacterium into the plant leaves, those three genes will penetrate the cell wall of the plants and then essentially turn the plant, those plant leaf areas red. Um, and for the first step, there's the agar place that we have to make that would, so that's like, it's just a plate like this. It's a circular plate with um, agar gel inside. And we've already made this from a couple of days ago. Um, shout out to Leo, um, once again. Um, so these agar plates is what allows the agrobacterium to grow. And today what we're gonna do is have a few volunteers come up and help us put the agrobacterium onto the plates and inoculate it, basically spread it around so that it can grow in the plate over the next day or so. And then tomorrow we're going to take the bacteria that has grown, that contains the three genes, and put it in a media solution, which is just you know, a solution that allows us to um, uh, penetrate that, inject that into the plant cell wall, and, and then over the next two to seven days, we'll see some growth of um, the redness on the plant leaves. Um, yeah, and then I'll go back to this slide in a little bit. This is really just about um, the instruction part, like the instructions for the step. Um, but what I also need people to do, if you're interested in getting a plant gene edited tomorrow, my one assignment is that you have to go out in Chiang Mai and find a plant. And the only two criteria that I would ask for is one, it cannot be a waxy leaf. Like it can't be, you know, glossy. That type of leaf it has to be like this. Um, and it has to be potted so that it has room to grow and it's not gonna die immediately. Um, so we're gonna do the first we're gonna do the first step right now, and then we're going to um, have everybody find a plant uh, tonight, and then tomorrow we're gonna do this part, and then over the next few days, it should turn red like this. But you can also make any design you want, so it doesn't have to be like this. You can like draw a letter or something. Um, so yeah, let's go back to here, and 